Well, thank you all for coming. Welcome back to a fabulous spring semester. Um, we're, uh, we're getting things started quickly here at the center and, and are very excited to welcome back Maka Halloran, who's no stranger to the, the center or to those of you that have been at the school for a little while, um, who's kind of opening up the, the lunchtime forum for us the, this semester. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about his bio. Before we get through the whole thing, it would go on for too long. So Michael came to us in um, 2006 after teaching architecture and landscape architecture at RISD, and then 15 years at the University of Colorado, where he was associate dean for the College of Architecture and Planning. In Rhode Island, he practiced for 12 years as a partner in Everett Clark and then Holleran Associates. That was a planning architecture and landscape architecture firm in Colorado. He chaired the Boulder Landmarks Board. Here at UT, he directs our, the Graduate Program in Historic Preservation, which is the job we were searching for him. I was on that search committee, and I remember we all decided we wanted to find the best person in the country we could find, or anywhere we could find, and that was very clearly Michael. Um, he earned his PhD at MIT. His first book was Boston's Changeful Times, Origins of Preservation and Planning in America. And now you get to hear about the next book. So please welcome Michael. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start this one since I am presenting among friends with an origin story of this project. When I moved to Colorado in 1991, I looked out the window of the bus in my first 10 minutes in Boulder and saw this little stream of water next to the street, uh, which was very interesting since we were at the top of a hill uh, and uh, learned about irrigation ditches uh, flowing at the tops of hills right where you're starting to get hot on your hike very conveniently located uh, so I had just spent five years immersed in the archives of upper-class Bostonians and decided that um, a little bit of water and dirt would be a nice palate cleanser. Uh, so I made myself into a minor expert on ditches uh, and their, particularly their preservation. Uh, in the process of learning all about water in the West, one of the things that I learned uh, is that most of it has been written as agricultural history or especially as the history of big engineering. Uh, and that's fine. I read a bunch of that stuff. I can tell you a little about it. But I'm an urban historian. And one of the things that I found uh, that I noticed that wasn't so much a dominant part of the story is that these water channels were in every American city in the arid and semi-arid west. They were an integral part of urban development. Uh, and that was a largely untold story. Every city that had them knew that they had them. People would tell you, oh, there's this weird thing in our history. Look, here's, you know, maybe they would get to show you, oh, here's a weird one that's left. Uh, uh, I felt that they were as basic a part of the urban history of the West, a more basic part than almost anything else that could be told. So that's, uh, that's how I come to this project, and that's the book that I'm, uh, that I'm planning to write. It's looking at five cities. Uh, they're arranged here in order of their modern European settlement. Uh, and they're chosen to be big cities. Chosen to be cities that you've all heard of. Um, uh, chosen to position the book as a, as a history, as something that will be recognized as real urban history, not um, an idiosyncratic, cute story of Santa Fe or Boulder. It's the same story in all of these cities. Uh, part of what I've learned, having gotten into these choices, is that uh, their bigness acted as an accelerant on their history. So they're, they're actually good choices for 
telling the story as well as for having it recognized as nesting within the, the historiography of cities. So I'm going to focus primarily, and talk today, I will draw from all five cities, um, but I will, I will draw primarily from Los Angeles. And the, the reason for that is partially just sort of an accident that in starting work on the book, Los Angeles was my last first archive visit. So after spending a week or more in each of the archives to s soak ditches into my brain um, and getting a little bit confused, uh, uh, by the time I got to LA, I said, OK, now I've done all of them. Let's stick with one so I can get it coherent in my brain. And it turns out to be a very interesting one, or, uh, as each of them is. But uh, Los Angeles is the one city of the five that has um, no surviving ditches flowing today. In Los Angeles, they were called Zanjas. Uh, here is Zanja number 8R on Figueroa Street, about a block down from the poster view. And another part of the origin of the book, the exact moment of the origin of the book, I actually could look <coughs> up in the timestamp on my uh, phone because two years ago, three years, going on three years ago at the uh, SAH conference as I was thinking about this, um, I took a break to go look. I had been reading enough to know that people who knew about the water history of Los Angeles said that there was nothing left. There was not a single trace that could be seen anywhere of this heritage in the city, people who had researched it for decades. So if you look in this view behind me, do I have the little, uh, no, well, screw it. If you look, look at the Zanha channel, look at the concrete walls, look at the little bridges, look at the ironwork on the bridges. Okay, if I can take an afternoon off of a conference and go find a piece of the 110-year uh, dead Zanha system, then it's time to write the book and L.A. is in. Uh, <clears throat> rest of the talk is loosely organized around three different themes that will be <coughs> conference papers that I'm giving to explore different aspects of the story as I, I, essentially I have it organized as a, as a book outline and the beginnings of a manuscript and some of these cut across the outline and sort of test whether it holds water. Sorry, this is really great for dad jokes. Uh, so I need to, the first one, uh, uh, at the Vernacular Architecture Forum, Pueblo Water, City Water, looks at this as a succession of cultures and cultural landscape. Um, and I have to make a nod to other people's titles, especially to Charles Porter uh, in San Antonio. Uh, each of these books, and um, particularly Daniel Torres Ralph, the before LA, he doesn't have the title trope of mine, but he really is telling the cultural succession story. Um, I don't, that's a long and interesting story and I'm not going to try to get into it today. I don't actually think that the uh, story is the driving, that part of the value of the comparative uh, uh, perspective <coughs> Um, the transition from Spanish colonial to Mexican to Anglo-American culture and, and uh, water and economic regimes is, of course, important. Um, but I think that the biggest driving factor is from town to city. Uh, so the fact that town is written in Spanish has more to do with the fact that we're in L.A. We can explore that. I think uh, the history got racialized 
it got racialized in the way that any valuable resource gets racialized, federal mortgage guarantees, seats at the front of the bus. Uh, but the, the, the rich story is in the ways that water and people and land and cities unfold as the cities grow. Uh, first thing you need to, to recognize to understand that is how integral agriculture and cities were um, in Hispanic or Anglo or, or any uh, pre-modern urban fabric. Uh, the official city seal of Los Angeles throughout the 19th century had a grapevine at the center of it, Los Angeles. Not Los Angeles County, not Los Angeles region, not Southern California. Los Angeles, Pueblo de la Reina, <coughs> de Los Angeles, produced the majority of wine in uh, the United States for a number of those decades within the city. Uh, the best photographic evidence that I can show you of that kind of fabric is this view three blocks from the center of Boulder. Uh, here is the Anderson Ditch in the foreground. Here is the urban agricultural landscape. Uh, Part of the agricultural landscape is livestock um, and, and uh, animals like plants, like water. Um, but even more driving this as, part, as a major engine of urban history to understand is that horses were the energy system of the, the pre-industrial city. So it's not just uh, what are we going to eat, what are we going to drink. It's, um, it's not just agriculture and urban history. It is the energy history. This is, this is uh, the network of channels that you can think of as the equivalent of the oil pipelines and gas pipelines <coughs> uh, and electrical lines, growing the alfalfa, feeding the horses, running the city. What about people? Um, domestic water in urban environments is a really complex story, which is also really undertold, as I've, as I've learned. I was very familiar. And this is part of that big engineering bias. I was very familiar, and you can read a, a ton of stuff about the advent of modern piped water systems in any American city and cities around the world. Um, and there's usually a fairly simple succession story. The succession story for Los Angeles is there was on you know, there was a benighted weird time when be people drank muddy water out of the street and then they got pipes and all was good. Uh, uh, the, the history of where and how people found water in cities, how they screwed it up, and how they dealt with having screwed it up, uh, is very nuanced so that in each of my cities where I've been able to drill into it, there, there were usually at least three or four different ways that people got household water. Um, so the Barilaro in Brownsville, which um, I don't have a San Antonio photo, but this, you know, this guy's cousin was dragging the barrel around there. Um, it's, it, you see the photo, anyway, you see the water cart in New York City. It's not some weird Western or weird Spanish colonial thing. It's one way to get water around. Uh, um, oh, sorry, uh, one last thing I want to say about this. In that complex web, the ditches were one of the ways of getting household water. And whether that was water to drink or water to wash things or water to bathe in or just water to wash down the yard really depended on the exact time, the exact place, and the exact people. Stanley Crawford, um, who wrote the book Maya Domo, which is still the best ditch book in English, 
uh, talks about this in, in managing, in the 1970s, a rural acequia in northern New Mexico, uh, refers to this as water for the chickens. The acequia, which irrigated during the growing season, but it had to be kept running all year round. And the reason that the paciantes explained it needed to be kept running all year round was that you needed water for the chickens. And that was, Crawford realized, a sort of maintaining one's dignity way of saying, we drink this water, you know, we need the water all the time because uh, uh, it's our water. One last urban expression of, uh, uh, of water in the landscape, particularly in the western United States, was street trees. You see here in Phoenix some little whips planted next to the street lateral, uh, waiting to be watered and grow up to make the desert feel more familiar to people coming from the east. This may, in fact, be an ethnic cleavage. There's there are accounts in the uh, Ayuntamiento records in Los Angeles of uh, Mexicans saying basically what's with these Anglos who like to plant trees where they don't belong. Um, but they also planted trees. So it's uh, uh, water, trees, sun, shade. The cultural landscape transition uh, can be told in terms of control. Uh, control in and of the landscape, control of time, space, people, and water. Uh, here from Los Angeles is a water permit. It is a night water permit, which is half the price of a day water permit. It is printed in hot pink so that no one can get away with paying for a night water permit and then say, yeah, here's my permit and while well, you're using it during the day. Uh, from the colonial city to the, uh, to, from the colonial Pueblo to the, to the uh, Anglo city, <coughs> the time regime changed from one that was informal, worked out by grabbing the Zanjero and arranging with him, I need some water, can I take it tomorrow? No, can I take it the next day? Okay. To this system in which you had to go downtown on a particular day of the month, apply for your water permit, list your preferred times, get told later which time you were going to get, come back, pay for your water permit and take it. Uh, uh, for garden watering, which I read as a proxy uh, uh, for water for the chickens, household water, it was one hour a day. Uh, and all of this changed from at the beginning, a sunset to sundown, 15 minutes before, sun, uh, after sundown, to, to a clock time regime. Uh, Space changed from a process of field locating ditches, you go out and figure out where if you dig here the water will flow, to one of surveyed topography and then surveyed topography with specifications and design drawings and bids. Uh, alignments of the ditch uh, after a certain point in the history begin to have less to do with where do we need water than with where do we need the water to be so that it's out of the way of the street or building or other urban thing that we're trying to build here that it's in the way of. And one more piece of space control, the, the uh, Zanjero, who had always had access to any property, the Zanjero has to, you know, if water's overflowing, if there's a problem, the Zanjero needs to be able to get to it. That became more and more of a contentious to thing uh, to the point where people would relocate Zanjas so that this person couldn't come on their property. Uh, control of people changed from the Zanja, Asequia, as, uh, and this is true as well of ditches, and in some places remains true of ditches to this day, 
as a um, communal labor responsibility. You have this many acres underwater, you have this many acres with these crops, you need to do two full days of labor or supply someone who will. Two, uh, uh, in the early Anglo administration of Los Angeles, labor that was done by chain gangs that were primarily Indians on a very charming system in which you would pay the Indians in alcohol, the Indians would get drunk, you would lock them up, you would auction them off for a chain gang for the next week. Uh, uh, to eventually a, um, uh, a, a urban wage labor market, which is actually where William Mulholland entered the ditch ecosystem as a uh, day laborer on, on the ditches. The Zanjaro uh, was the most important official of the Pueblo, more important than there wasn't a mayor, there was a justice of the peace to, of the Ayuntamiento, uh, went to becoming an appointed municipal position. Antonio Coronel was the last Mexican Zanjaro, the first uh, Zanjaro in the U.S. administration. He went on to become mayor, he went on to become uh, treasurer of the state of California. Um, mayors went on to become Zanjaro. Uh, Zanjaro was paid more than the mayor, more than the city attorney, more than anyone else in the municipal system. Uh, that changed over the later decades of the 19th century as the city engineer became an office, as the city engineer looking out for the urban functions of the city became the dominant voice in how will the water work in those systems. The Zanjaro became a uh, uh, staff position within the city engineer's department. And eventually, as you can see here in 1919, the very peculiar uh, institution of a civil service examination for Zanjaro. Control of water went from something that you did with a shovel by making dirt here or there so the water would flow the way you wanted it to, to there's, there are some really poignant passages in which the city is trying to explain to people that they have to put gates on their ditches and having to explain to people what <coughs> gates are, how, how do you build this thing out of wood that you're going to put in the ditch and have it control the water. Two engineered bid document uh, gates, and eventually to piping. We're not talking about pressurized urban uh, modern water system. We're just talking about a ditch that flows unpressurized underneath the ground. But underneath the ground is a very nice control system because you can't get at it unless you're supposed to. Uh, Control of water was also, I guess this control of water and people, uh, uh, stealing water, which was not a concept in the Ayuntamiento. The water was for everybody. Uh, it became not for everybody. It became part of a, a cash administration. Um, it became possible to steal it uh, and possible to be prosecuted for it. And you'll see by the stealing water and by the bathing in Zanha that we have a control system for both water quantity and water quality. Uh, so William Mulholland is the uh, possibly patron saint or devil of all of big engineering and water in the country. Uh, and the Los Angeles aqueduct here on its opening day with his memorably brief speech. Uh, uh, this is not my story. This is where my story ends. Mulholland killed the Zanjas and a measure of his uh, uh, hegemony as an engineer is that every other city in, the, in, in my story has tried to kill its Zanjas, Asekias, ditches, or canals. Only Mulholland succeeded. Uh, 
May 31st, 1904, the last day water flowed in the Zanas. It is so hard to get a last date on anything historically, so as I say, measure of Mulholland's control. That's not my story, but that you, you saw that channel of water coming down with uh, 45,000 people waiting at the bottom to watch it. There was nothing there. What the hell are we going to do with that water? You can, I don't know if you can read it here, but a very peculiar passage, surplus aqueduct water. Yes, we just diverted a river 250 miles, and it flows into a bunch of uninhabited land. Uh-oh, we better figure out something to do with it. So Mulholland, after killing the Zanhas, made a temporary 200 square mile uh, ditch irrigation landscape called San Fernando Valley. Uh, and he designed a many, many hundreds of miles, one of the largest orders of steel pipe ever placed. Uh, but faster than steel pipe is digging a ditch. And at the end of the steel pipe, you deliver it to fields where you have farmers who don't know a lot yet about steel pipes, but they know how to dig a ditch. So we have a, uh, an extraordinary second generation ditch landscape, even bigger than the first one, designed entirely as a transitional phase of urban development. Uh, my second subject is water qualities, and I've hinted a little bit on that already. Uh, uh, the, the discovery in reading people reacting to and arguing about water in these places uh, is that water was not a single thing. The, the, the water idea that we as urban dwellers have today, um, leaving aside the plastic water bottle business, Water is one thing. It comes out of a pipe. Uh, water was, was recognized as a very diverse set of things with different qualities. Built into the pre-modern, pre-urban Zanha, Asekia regime were some water quality conflicts that were ancient, that were millennia old. One of them is washing uses. Um, and you see here uh, in the mid 20th century, uh, provides water for laundry and bathing. Many residents drink the water. Um, this is an ancient conflict. It's one that's there throughout the, the uh, uh, centuries of, of record in the archives. And it's, uh, uh, it's the, the idealized, the, the prototypical way that you manage this one is to build a lavanderia, to build a, a laundry facility that is offline. It takes water from the supply, but it does not put its water back into the supply. Um, they don't have to be as, as uh, baroquely lovely as the one in Oaxaca. Um, but no matter what, you know, even built out of wood by the side of the ditch, it's still a capital expenditure, and it was more trouble than most people wanted to, to do, and therefore laundry water ended up in the ditch. The other ancient traditional water quality uh, uh, conflict built into these water systems, livestock drink from the ditch, livestock produce substances out of them, and they're not too fussy about whether they go in the ditch or not. Uh, uh, this is a prosecution for endangering ditch water quality, state of California versus Ah Hay. It's um, uh, Chinese people tended to be the ones uh, prosecuted for endangering water quality. I have my doubts that they're the only ones who are messing up the ditch, but uh, uh, back to that question of how did people understand and manage their, um, uh, their water, their household water and their drinking water. Uh, this, is, this is one where I have to credit our studio, Mexico. Two years ago when I was 
co-teaching with Ben Hamin in the Yucatan, we had students who were looking at, uh, at the Noria in our little town, looking at history, found early Mexican, uh, early 20th century Mexican government instructions on how to build a home water filter in your, uh, in, in your house, and thought, ah, I wonder. So here we have the part of that answer to how the water for chickens became water for people to drink. Uh, those were the traditional water quality problems and water quality management solutions. Uh, now we have a growing city, we have a growing industrial city, and we have new kinds of problems. Um, in LA, uh, gas works, this is the, uh, this was, gas for street lighting, starting in 1867. Natural gas was not yet um, a concept. Natural gas was a, uh, in the very, very embryonic petroleum industry, natural gas was an odd and annoying, dangerous byproduct. No one knew yet how to capture it. Uh, so gas was a manufactured uh, substance. If those of you who are not students and who are old enough to remember the, the 1970s energy crisis may remember coal gasification as one solution. LA didn't have so much coal, it had tar in tar pits and that too could be gasified. Um, and I haven't found the exact chemical answer to this, but when you take tar and you extract methane from it, what's left is bad to drink. Uh, and it went into a pipe and it found its way into one of the zanhas. This was the first very, it actually went into a, a proto sewer from which it found its way into the zanhas. This was an, an, an enormous environmental issue in Los Angeles to the point that the city, as they were fighting this out legally and and discovering that the gas company seemed to somehow have a right to put whatever the hell it wanted into the sewers. The, at one point, the city council's answer was, well, screw it, we won't have sewers then. Now what you gonna do? Uh, another particularly Los Angeles question, as we get a little farther along in the, the uh, embryonic, now infant, petroleum industry, uh, uh, oil wells, which as you can see were a somewhat unregulated piece of the urban landscape. And in the foreground, you can picture for yourself, this is unlike the gas works which were deliberately using the water system as a sink. The oil industry, which was a more extensive, it was point source, but hundreds and thousands of these points. Um, and they didn't want the oil to go into the water, it's just that sometimes it did. Uh, so this is right upstream from our uh, lovely Zanha 8R on the poster and suddenly got those people in their nice houses to want to cover their Zanha and not be so interested in it. The last and I can't even, you can help me rank order for weirdness, but uh, the, the last of the water quality stories in the Zanhas in Los Angeles, you see here the city sewer discharge slash south side irrigation company. Uh, the water in the Zanhas eventually left the city of Los Angeles and the excess was bought by farmers south of the city, they were always short on water. Um, as the city did build a sewer system, it had an excess of that kind of water. In almost every other city, the answer as, as uh, uh, engineers were happy to tell at least to the mid 20th century, the solution to pollution is dilution. And the problem with dilution in Los Angeles is that the river did not have any water in it. So it's one of the only places where putting the sewage into the river could not be the answer because it would become a river of sewage. And even Los Angeles 
people downstream from Los Angeles figured out that wasn't okay. Interestingly, though, what they did think was okay was to put it on their fields and grow crops with it, including vegetable crops. Uh, uh, so several decades of interesting uh, conflict, again, which is more than I can do today, but a lot of the, uh, the, you know, the basic story is that since people were using um, uh, cesspool solids as fertilizer, since people were, were, were emptying privies to use as a nitrogen source, the, the uh, sewage irrigation was not a bug, it was a feature, but it was a highly contested feature among different kinds of farmers about different kinds of sewage at uh, different times of year with different demands for water. Uh, and as uh, to, to, uh, to contextualize the weirdness, Los Angeles was by far the largest uh, sewage farming uh, operation in North America, but the much larger contemporary ones were Paris and Berlin. So, more history there. Last one. Uh, uh, modern piped water or proto-modern piped domestic water started in 1868 in Los Angeles. The growth of the Zanha system, and Blake's map has to stand in for mine, that is nowhere near done. Uh, but the, um, the bulk of the Zanha lines that you're seeing here were built after 1868. So the succession story of we had ditches, then we got pipes, we got rid of the ditches. A, as a very, very short story, that is true. Um, but an even slightly longer story is we had ditches, we got pipes, we built a ton more ditches and put a lot more water in them, um, including in places where we had the pipes. That's really, really interesting. And uh, the story basically, it, uh, it, uh, again, in a, in a short time, so you all get to answer, to ask questions. Uh, uh, is that when you have two different technological systems with different traits, you can explore the ways that they can interact with one another. You can explore their differential benefits. Uh, and it's, yeah. Uh, so adaptive urban uses. Here is street watering. I love, love, love. I have looked for this photo for 30 years and I found it. Uh, this is street watering in action. Here is a horse pulling a cart with a barrel in Salt Lake City, laying, sprinkling water on the dust so you don't have dust. And bearing in mind the horse as the power system, you can imagine what the dust is actually composed of. And best, I got this, I got the high resolution yesterday and had not noticed, but you can, had not noticed till I got it. You can see where the horse cart pulled up to the ditch to refill. Uh, <coughs> I don't think you'd look close enough. Uh, I have time now. <laughs> Ditches, uh, as a technological system, offer what historians of technology call affordance, meaning you can figure them out. They are made for DIY interventions. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of water wheels installed for various purposes. Um, this one for the purpose of raising water to wash horses and carriages. I could not find a, I have not yet found a photo of the washing horses and carriages, so. Uh, but you can see Los Angeles has been at that longer than it knew. Uh, water provided, uh, uh, provided water power. Los Angeles used it for industrial mills. Los Angeles at a certain point in the 1870s had this completely delusional idea that it was going to become a water-powered industrial city. After that, you see here on, uh, where there is a drop on a canal, 
um, you see in the background a hydroelectric plant to uh, harvest industrial power in another way from the potential energy of water and gravity. Water became available for uh, uh, industrial process water for various purposes, using it as a sink for pollutants. Is one always popular industrial uh, water use, but here we have uh, a petition to tap the Zanha Madre, now underground, for a uh, commercial laundry without a uh, uh, without a Chinese name on it. And it's and what's really fun is looking at this. You, you realize what they're really doing is formalizing what they've already been doing from seepage. And probably somebody came in and, and waterproofed the Zanha Madri, and they said, crap, that's not working anymore. Um, the cultural landscapes of irrigation were themselves repurposed as uh, uh, of, of agricultural irrigation as urban cultural landscapes, most particularly in Phoenix which cannibalized its citrus orchards as suburban orchards, keeping the flood irrigation system in the suburban yards. Ditches have been uh, taken as urban design amenities, as water feature amenities, uh, um, including the, the crazy thing that Scottsdale, Arizona has a waterfront district um, there have been other miscellaneous <laughs> cultural appropriations of the landscape. <laughs> the most important of the adaptations are uh, uh, recreational use of the rights of way, um, trails, bicycle trails, in some cases, roads, parkways like the one in, in Denver have been uh, consistent uses of one kind and another. And the significance is, mu is I, I would argue, greater than simply we have a place to run in the city. It is that this is an alternative network of rights of way. This is a major structural network to the city. And most of the, ad of the adaptations um, come from that, come from its urban morphological qualities um, as a right-of-way, also, back to basics, as a means of moving water, which they have done for drainage, which they have done uh, uh, and continue to do, including this one with the gentleman and his dog, as part of the Phoenix water system. You are drinking that downstream from this photo. Uh, uh, and including inadvertently, but very importantly, as the last remaining riparian habitats. This one doesn't look like much in Phoenix, but elsewhere they are riparian habitats. There are endangered species that exist only in the rights of way of what were centuries ago artificial uh, paths of water. So I've been... Uh, Delivering this as, a, as an historian, not a preservationist, uh, I'm going to return for my conclusion to, to be a preservationist for one moment, to say that um, the majority of our urban water use in the US, as around the world, is for maintaining cultural landscapes, landscapes that we have chosen for whatever reason to have. Uh, as long as that remains so, then Ditches, canals, acequias, um, there are zanjas not in Los Angeles anymore, are a cultural landscape and the right number of them to have flowing is not zero. Thank you. All right, we're open for questions. Hey, Professor Holloway, great work. I'm super interested in it. I was curious if your work will touch on the later things of channelization and other programs in the world's role in channelizing 
basically making bigger ditches, especially in LA. Can you touch on that? My focus is on the artificial channels, and uh, that's, even as I say that answer, that doesn't work very well for the Los Angeles River, which is a pretty artificial channel. But my, my, my focus is on the channels that have been diverted from their natural drainage purpose. There's a great, I haven't put it in here, but on the, on the subject of urban design, there's a great line, a great explanation by Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., who did some consulting work in 1910 uh, uh, in Boulder on this, explaining the differences in the essentially the phenomenology of the ditch versus a natural drainage, which is that because it is, in theory at least, a controlled flow in a controlled functional space, um, the water can be high. The water can be near the eye level, and it completely changes how you perceive it and, and how it works. Uh, so the LA River, whatever its potential, can only function that way phenomenologically in the landscape by bringing people to the water. Uh, and Blake Gumprecht did a good job with the LA River. Uh, um, other people, I mean, rivers are a really good subject that has received attention. Um, so I'm I'm sticking with my weird thing once the water leaves the river. There must be an equally parallel story in the story of sewage. Yeah, yeah. I didn't because think I was going to be writing it till I got to LA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's fresh water in, and then there's bad water out. Yeah. Well, that's in the in eastern in all cities, um, in, in, including ancient Rome. Uh, yeah. The story always is you build the water system first, and after that you notice that this water, like, it's flowing in. Yeah. Um, and in, in a sense, even aside from what you have done to that water in, the, in your metabolic processes, you suddenly have a lot of water. I mean, the Owens Valley water flows into Los Angeles. It's got to go somewhere. Yeah. It's like arteries and veins, right? And that is exactly it, yeah. And you, you can picture the, the uh, engineers who figured out, let's build an arterial system. Oh, veins, <laughs> right. A uh, couple more ventricles. Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. So as you uh, showed in your slideshow that the uh, Interston ditch is still flowing in Boulder, and places like the Asuncio Madre and Santa Fe still flow. I've been to both of those. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them, other smaller places, they're still they're still in use. Places like Attitude in New Mexico have also been to. So I'm kind of wondering, um, since they're still flowing and being maintained, what is the what do you think is the present value of uh, of the Asikias or Asikias uh, today. And is it cultural? Is it symbolic? Is it infrastructure? Um, what's, its, what's its purpose and why are they still valuable <coughs> in these places? I think it's all of those things. And I think the, the, uh, um, the important thing about any of these, these networks mm -hmm. and their value is yeah, that they are they, they are really, really multi-dimensional. They are aesthetic and cultural and hydrological and ecological uh, assets in a variety of different ways. Um, and they, they suffer from um, any kind of evaluation that tries to simplify them. Um, anything that, that can quantify some part of that and therefore account for only one dimension of what they're doing um, will optimize the subsystem and miss the big system. Uh, uh, but I think that you, know, you mentioned the fact that they are being maintained, and that is to me the most fascinating part of the technological his story today because they're high maintenance, it takes a lot of work, it takes consistent attention. They are water, which is extraordinarily valuable. So none of this happens. I mean, it, if it happens today, it doesn't happen again tomorrow. 
unless there's a community of people seeing and acknowledging value in them. Michael, you, you started your talk, thank you, for a great presentation. I, I loved it. And thank I you. I want to learn more about those ditches. I hope you will soon have an opportunity yeah. to read more about them. <laughs> so you, you started your presentation by telling us that you don't want to racialize this history. That I understand mm -hmm. that it's, a, it's a minefield, right? It's a, it's a very difficult... But you ask, yeah, you ask but, a question, I'll... But, but I wonder, isn't that a gigantic effort not to racialize it? Well, how, how do you pretend to balance that? I mean, what's the... I, 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 I aimed for 43 minutes and I hit 44 minutes. And the mm -hmm. story that you're asking about wouldn't have... Yeah. Well, no, it just wouldn't have gotten us here. I'm not trying not to racialize it. In fact, one of the, you know, part of the decision to write the book was recognizing that I have to deal with environmental justice, I have to deal with, um, and you know, particularly with the uh, domestic water supply and the, uh, you know, part of, part of the telling of that su technological succession is now we have a piped water system, so everyone's got piped water, and in San Antonio, 20 years after the piped water system, approximately 20% of the people in the city used it. So, like, that's interesting. I wonder, gee, everybody else must be really thirsty if that's all we got now. And, it, and, and more complicated even than that, because on the far west side, you know, the poorest part, poorest places didn't even have the acequias. Uh, so, there's absolutely a, a environmental justice stories throughout every aspect of this, the flood has, I mean, long stories. Uh, um, and they are central. Uh, the story that I think is specifically overtold, and it, I don't, it's not for me to argue against it, it's just to say, okay, it's, it's being told, uh, is the one of there is a Spanish colonial coming from the, the uh, uh, Islamic tradition of irrigation. There is an indigenous tradition of irrigation. These cultures uh, uh, brought irrigation to North America. I don't believe that seeing it in um, in racialized or ethnic cultural succession terms actually describes the story of what happened then. Um, you have Anglos in Los Angeles strongly arguing for the traditional Hispanic system, you know, the, the, the values on water and how it should be administered uh, come out in conflicts over what do we do now here with this thing, uh, and it's a wonderfully complicated story. And what what caused my attention on the way you presented is that water fluctuates between being desirable and undesirable. Yep. And it's yep. again and again as the technology changes, as the demand changes, as the culture changes. It can be desirable, becomes undesirable, then it's desirable again, then it's undesirable again. And it's desirable this morning, and then when there's a break in the ditch bank, it's really undesirable this afternoon. Yeah. And, and, and to me, what I think you cannot avoid is the fact that it's desirable, then it's appropriated by some groups to the detriment of others. Then when it's undesirable, it's dumped on some groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of that, there. All of that happened. Yeah. All of that happened. All the time. Uh, uh, I understand that both the urban historian, the technological, and the racialized points of view are insufficient. All of them alone are insufficient. But when they overlap, it becomes really, really rich. Yes, yes. What, what most fascinates me about it is the fine grain of how it actually worked. Uh, and and that's a thing. I mean, it was it was a great surprise to me when I started in on this subject 
more than 20 years ago and suddenly discovered that I had an international subject and colleagues in Spain and colleagues in Mexico and, and things to talk about with them because water flows downhill and does all these things and you know there are there are diverse cultural ways to deal with it but there's a sort of basic armature there that you got to deal with and it's just wonderful we probably have time for one more Thank you. This was really joyful. Um, I wanted to ask if you could say something about your approach from a kind of you know, macro scale uh, in terms of how you identify the exact subject you were going to look at and the cases to maybe a more micro scale to what do you actually look for in the places and what, you know how do you look for your materials, um, what are you looking for, <clears throat> Everything. Uh, um, trying to answer that one succinctly, I am, as an historian, uh, my methodology is is to be omnivorous to look for the for the different kinds of sources that triangulate. Uh, so obviously, I will read histories. Um, I, I, as you can tell, love graphic sources of any kind. I'm doing mapping. I'm looking through city records. I'm looking for whatever there is. It's a, a um, part of what drives that is that the parts that are most interesting. I mean, this is this is the the uh, most ordinary of life except when it's extraordinary, but the ordinariness is what drives it, and that then you have to dig deeper for that. Uh, um, I, I alluded to the fact that trying to figure out when something ended is almost impossible because nobody wants to talk about that. Everyone wants to talk about the new stuff, and I'm interested in the old stuff. Um, uh, I mean, it's easy to find out when something began, or like the first yeah, time? Yeah, the yeah. Fir the first water flowing through the pipes in Los Angeles, got the date, got the newspaper articles. Um, uh, the, other, the, the other part that I'll, that I'll say is that having some familiarity, having some tangible familiarity, I mean, I have cleaned these ditches. I have, um, uh, I started this project by getting myself the absolutely unwanted uh, historical job of going out and walking the damn things to, to assess what was there. And I, you know, so I've walked many tens of miles of them documenting and mapping things and spent a lot of time with ditch people and spent a lot of time with mud on my boots. So having some understanding of what is the water actually doing and why are people doing this stuff with it uh, is, is really a helpful thing to bring into an archive. Is there a huge mosquito problem? Not, not so much because it's flowing water and it's in a yeah. Uh, I mean, they feed wetlands. There, there are mosquitoes who are who may or may not know that they owe their their livelihoods to the ditch. But <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.